Welcome back. So last but not least, we have sleep disorders. So I have a lot of good videos for this section. Um, again, it's the section I actually work in and do clinical work in. So um, feel free if you have any questions about the material in class, just let me know. Um, I think it's a really fascinating area, but I'm completely biased. So narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is a very rare disorder. It's about one in every 5,000 people has narcolepsy. And it's where an individual is either drowsy all the time or has sudden attacks of sleep. These individuals have abnormal nighttime sleep that leads to sleep intruding on weight during the day. Um, so they'll have these attacks of sleep that often occur several times a day and can last anywhere between five and 30 minutes. So with diagnosing narcolepsy, there are a couple of telltale signs that we look for. One is the um, ability to fall asleep very quickly and then go straight into REM sleep. This is often diagnosed during a sleep study in a procedure that we call an, a multiple sleep latency test, or MSLT. In this, pa in this test, the patient is given sleep opportunities um, to nap just during the day for about 20 minutes each time. If the patient is able to, on average, fall asleep over the multiple trials in eight minutes or less, um, and on at least two of the trials to reach REM sleep in the 20 minutes, then it is indicative of narcolepsy. The REM sleep is an important part of that because narcolepsy is often an intrusion of REM sleep in particular. Um, we often also assess cataplexy, which is a feeling of weakness with strong emotion. So we'll ask someone, you know, do you feel physically weak or ever, you know, fall or lose your balance when you're um, especially emotional, either positively or negatively? Lastly, we look for other signs of REM intrusion, such as frequent um, hypnagogic hallucinations, which are where either after you just fell asleep or just woke up, you have a hallucination that essentially your brain's still in REM sleep, so you're seeing your dream, or sleep paralysis. So I do have a quick video on narcolepsy, so let me pull that up really fast. Thirty-six-year-old Nicole Jurey is a member of the Ladies Professional Golf Association and has been for 13 years. But concentrating on her game became more and more difficult due to narcolepsy, a condition where a person's sleep and awake cycles are constantly interrupted. I was diagnosed with narcolepsy in the height of my career. I was falling asleep all the time and I would go to doctors and try to figure out what was wrong with me and everybody kept saying that I just led a crazy lifestyle. Yeah, sleep is controlled by an internal clock. The brain actually has a little pacemaker behind the eyes. You have neurotransmitters in that pacemaker that fire. It's, it's almost like an electrical circuit that goes out to relay stations and those relay stations have neurotransmitters or chemicals that relay this signal. And so the brain wakes up at a certain time. That signal lasts for a certain number of hours. And then when it begins to wear off, it shuts off and another circuit inhibits wakefulness and promotes sleep. Narcolepsy disrupts this function and excessive daytime sleepiness is usually the first most obvious symptom. But there are other symptoms that can be disturbing and very frightening, like cataplexy. And cataplexy is the sudden loss of muscle tone or the development of muscle weakness, usually triggered by a strong emotional stimulus. More often than not, that emotional stimulus is laughter, happiness, joy, surprise. Sometimes it can be negative things like anger, fright, loud noises. But typically, it's good things. I was playing in a golf tournament, and I, whenever I would hit a good shot, I couldn't move afterwards. And I would stand there, and I was worried I was going to fall to the ground. And I was very worried because I thought there was, you know, a life-threatening condition. I wasn't sure what was wrong with me. While many narcoleptics have cataplexy, not all of them do. Some have another symptom called automatic behavior.
I call it living in the twilight zone. If you were to stay up all night and try to function the next day, then you're tired and you're sleepy and sometimes they'll have automatic activity. They may do something and not exactly remember that they did that, even drive. I walked into the men's john one time and the guy said, you're not supposed to be in here. And I said, well, why not? And he said, you're in the men's room. Oh, I was asleep. I had no idea what I was doing. So those were things that I used to do all the time. There are treatments available that can make living with narcolepsy easier. The medications that we have tend to improve alertness and stop the episodes of emotion-induced muscle weakness. The ones that improve alertness tend to stimulate the cell groups in the brain that are important for keeping us awake. So they're not actually correcting the loss of the chemical, they're just aiding in our ability to remain awake. Thanks to a combination of therapies, Nicole now has her narcolepsy under control. I'm not falling asleep when I drive. I'm not falling asleep on the golf course ever. I never do that anymore. I've learned how to pay attention to my body and learned what keeps me more awake. All right, so hopefully that was um, helpful in giving you an idea of what narcolepsy is like. There we go. So narcolepsy does run in families, so there's believed to be a genetic component. Specifically in narcolepsy um, and narcoleptic dogs, there's been found to be a mutant gene for um, hypotritin. Similarly, humans with narcolepsy usually have lost about 90% of their hypotritin cells. Thus, it's thought that hypotritin may help hold sleep at bay, and without it, narcolepsy may occur. Hypotritin is also the reason we discussed the hypothalamus earlier as playing a role in sleep. Uh, the hypotritin neurons in the hypothalamus project to other sleep centers throughout the brain, including the basal forebrain, the reticular formation, uh, locus coriolis, um, so a lot of the important areas. Adsons also go to the um, uh, tubar mammillary nucleus, which, um, when inhibited, causes slow-wave sleep. So thus, it's a very important neurotransmitter that affects wakefulness. The fact that it goes to these centers, and also that hypotritin appears to be needed to prevent sleep from occurring, has led to the conclusion that the hypothalamus controls wakefulness, REM sleep, and slow wave sleep, as it seems to be the only center that ties all three together and also affects all three. So sleep state misperception. So this is a um, another rare disorder. There's actually some debate as to whether or not it even exists, but um, personally I think it does because I've seen it clinically. So this is where people report insomnia even when they're asleep. So what actually happens is the person dreams that they're awake when they're really asleep. And it sounds very, very odd, but um, someone often what will happen is you may have someone that says they have horrible insomnia and they get into having a sleep study and they find that they ha you know they were staring at their alarm clock all night and then they wake up and they realize there's no alarm clock because they're not in their bedroom so something like that can be how a person realizes that they're actually dreaming that they're awake they're not actually awake during that time um Obviously, this is a very rare condition. Typically, people that think they have insomnia actually do have insomnia. And there are three types of insomnia, onset, maintenance, and terminal. Onset is having trouble falling asleep for the first time. Maintenance is having trouble during the night staying asleep. And terminal insomnia is waking before you intend to in the morning. So a couple more notes on insomnia. It can be either a primary or a secondary disorder. So a primary disorder means it's the primary problem. Secondary means it's due to another disorder. So for instance, if, if you have pain, that could actually cause your insomnia because the pain is keeping you awake. So about 6% of people uh, meet criteria for primary insomnia, where it's the problem in and of itself, 
but up to 58% of Americans report sleep problems, so this is a really prevalent problem. So a couple of facts that I think are important. One is that insomnia is not the same as not sleeping. If you look at people with insomnia, they actually get roughly the same amount of sleep as anyone without insomnia. The main difference is it takes them significantly longer to get that same amount of sleep. So I may, you know, both me and someone else, maybe someone with insomnia, may get eight hours of sleep, but I may spend, you know, eight and a half, eight hours, 45 minutes in bed, whereas they may spend 12 hours in bed. So that's the difference. It's a sleep that's much more fragmented and therefore not as restful. Another thing, people often think of insomnia as a symptom of depression, but the research tells us that insomnia actually precedes depression more often than depression precedes insomnia. So it's not accurate to say that it's just a symptom because if anything, it's more a cause than a symptom. Also, if you don't treat insomnia um, in people who are depressed, if you just treat the depression, you're going to have more depression relapses um, than if you actually try to reduce the insomnia as well. Another thing that people don't often realize is that cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, or CBTI, is the standard of care for insomnia. This is what it's agreed to we really should be giving people. Um, in fact, the guidelines are that short-term hypnotic treatments, such as sleep medications, should be supplemented with CBTI, so you should um, only be giving um, sleep medications for the short-term and, when possible, have it combined with CBTI. And another thing is that having combined therapy, where you have both um, the cognitive therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and medication shows no benefit of for just giving the ther the um, talk therapy. So this is one of those areas that psychologists can really come in and have a huge impact because it's one of the areas where one of the few areas where everyone pretty much agrees our treatment is really really the best. Um, sleep medications have a lot of side effects and they're not something you really want to be on for a long period during most of the time. So CBTI is really a neat opportunity for us in psychology. Nightmares. Um, nightmares are pretty prevalent, more than a lot of people think. Um, roughly about 19-20% of children have weekly nightmares, and about 14-15% of college students actually have weekly nightmares. And I picked weekly because that's usually the cutoff used for clinically significant nightmares. So if you have weekly or more frequent nightmares, that's where we start thinking about treating it. Also from um, the second point, it's actually one of, it's actually my master's thesis. Um, only a third of those people had clinically significant PTSD symptoms. So I bring that up, I think that's important because that means that two thirds of the people, it's, it's not due to PTSD, it's that they typically always had nightmares, they had nightmares as a kid, and they never grew out of them. As adults, the estimates are anywhere between 2 to 6 percent of adults meet criteria for nightmare disorder, but more recent estimates have been closer to the 6 percent than the 2 percent. And nightmares are extremely clinically significant. They're associated with a bunch of different disorders, including PTSD, schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder, and dissociative disorders. They're also um, related with suicidal behavior, which is the area that I study. So a couple things that are important differentiations. Uh, there's actually a difference between nightmares and disturbing dreams. So nightmares are disturbing dreams that lead to a startled awakening. And disturbing dreams are negative dreams that do not lead to a startled awakening. So the difference is whether or not the awakening is startled. What we know in either case is that there's an awakening because you don't remember a dream unless you wake up from it. So either way, there's an awakening. The question is whether or not it's disturbing. Also, I wanted to mention that nightmares are treatable. Uh, Prazosin is a 
really good medication, essentially a blood pressure medication that's been shown to reduce PTSD nightmares. And also imagery rehearsal therapy has been shown to be, it's a talk therapy, it's a cognitive behavioral therapy that's been shown to be effective for nightmare disorder and also PTSD nightmares. So there are treatments out there if you have a client with nightmares. Um, and I'd be more than happy to talk with you about this if you're curious. Um, I actually did imagery rehearsal therapy for my dissertation. We did a treatment study of it. So I always like talking about this stuff. Sleep paralysis um, is a brief inability to move just before falling asleep or just after waking up. So having it occasionally is actually normal. Um, but if you have it often, it's thought to be a, um, a um, symptom of narcolepsy. And it's amazing. There are an amazing number of videos on YouTube about it saying that it's demon possession or something of that nature. It's, it's not. What it is, it's, it's um, the pons continuing to signal for muscle relaxation with REM sleep even though someone's awake. So the body is still inhibiting movement because it thinks it's still asleep when it's really awake. So it's natural, it passes after a minute or two, but it can be quite frightening if you don't know what's going on. Uh, night terrors and sleep enuresis. These are both um, slow wave sleep problems that happen primarily in children, but they can happen much later than that too. So night terrors, um, again, arise from slow wave sleep, and they're similar to nightmares, but people will uh, wake up often streaming. Um, you know, sweating, heart racing, uh, really distressed, but also very out of it, uh, very, very groggy and, um, and not, not with what's going on. And that's partly because it is arising from slow wave sleep. So this person is very, very asleep. You also have sleep in uresis, um, which is bedwetting, also associated with, um, with slow wave sleep. There are treatments for these. Uh, for night terrors, you can do scheduled awakening. So what this is, is night terrors typically happen at roughly the same time every night. And because of this, if you wake the person up for, say, you know, a half hour before they normally occur, just for like five minutes, it's enough to reset the sleep cycle so they're not at their normal spot in the sleep cycle when they hit that time that they normally have the night terrors. So just having that scheduled awakening can actually treat the problem. Also with sleep and uresis, there's actually the bell and, pa uh, bell and pad method, which I talked about a lot in my behavior therapy class, where when you, um, when you urinate on it, it sets off an alarm to utilize classical conditioning eventually to associate the feeling of needing to urinate with waking up, so the person then goes and uses the restroom. Um, then you have sub somnambulism. So this is sleepwalking. It occurs during stage three sleep. Again, I have stage three or four here, but remember those are combined now, so stage three sleep. And this also may persist in adulthood, but it's more prevalent during childhood. Now people always wonder, what do you do if you have someone sleepwalking? People debate this still. Overall, the consensus that I've seen is um, it's usually best not to wake up the individual, but rather to just kind of guide them back to bed. Because again, it's slow wave sleep. So the person, if you wake them up, is going to be disoriented. You know, they could lash out because they're not sure what's happening to them. So it's better to kind of guide them back and not wake them up than to wake them up. But people still debate this. That's just my take on it. REM behavior disorder. Okay, so this is an interesting disorder. So this is um, characterized um, with sleep where someone has it where during REM sleep they start acting out their dreams. So with this, studies have actually shown that about 38% of those with REM behavior disorder go on to develop Parkinson's disease approximately three to four years after the diagnosis. And also a third of Parkinson's patients have REM behavior disorder. So you have a pretty strong neurological link with Parkinson's. Um, 
The book mentions that anti-anxiety medications have been used to control REM behavior disorder, which is true. Um, they were actually first used because REM behavior disorder is often comorbid with periodic leg movement, another sleep disorder, that responds well to anti-anxiety medication. We don't know why they work for a REM behavior disorder, but they seem to help. Also, dopamine agonists, things that increase the effects of dopamine like L-DOPA, also seem to improve REM behavior disorder as well as periodic leg movement, suggesting that these disorders may actually be related and could actually be precursors to Parkinson's disease. So with this, I have a very brief video, it's a 30 second video, that shows you what REM behavior disorder looks like. So now that you've seen that, it leads in really well to another important aspect of treating REM behavior disorder, which is safety concerns. So again, people are acting out their dreams, and you may have a dream that something's attacking you and you're going to fight back. So you have to take precautions. Um, it may mean that spouses need to sleep in separate rooms. Also, people will sometimes jump up or jump out of bed with this disorder. So it's important to um, have it so you, you don't have sharp edges for someone to hit or things like that. Um, also, locking windows and doors sometimes is needed. So if someone doesn't jump out the window, that's actually happened. So you need to take some precautions in order to um, help ensure the safety of the individual. Sleep apnea. So this is a very common sleep disorder um, where someone may stop breathing or slow, um, well, pretty much just stop, stop breathing, um, which reduces oxygen in the brain and in the body. So each episode of sleep apnea arouses the person as they try to restore breathing. Um, so someone will actually stop breathing and then it wakes them up very briefly as they try to restore breathing. And it leads to very, very poor sleep continuity. Someone's always waking up all the time. And it can result in really bad daytime sleepiness. And so treatment includes a removable tube in the throat or a CPAP. A CPAP is um, a continuous positive airway pressure machine, which is what most people use. And this um, prevents the collapse of the airwaves. So I have a video um, for you. I actually have two videos, but I'll probably just show the one um, of Shaq and his CPAP machine. I don't know how many of you even remember Shaq. It's, I'm not going to be able to use this video much anymore, but hopefully it will. Hopefully you do, and hopefully this will be helpful. I snore? Yeah. See, I don't know if I snore because I don't hear myself, so. Oh, he hears himself because sometimes it wakes him up. And he's like, baby, was I snoring? Yeah, you were snoring. <laughs> it usually happens when he's on his back, and then he will just, he gets into that deep snore like the. I mean, it's deep. And then he stops. His chest will stop moving and everything. Like, he just, like, he was not breathing. So I nudged him, like, babe, wake up. And then he'd catch his breath. I'm like, dude, you just stopped breathing in your sleep. And I saved him. Pam's a registered polysomnographic technician. A poly what? Polysomnographic means sleep study. She'll be the one putting the electrodes in. Sleep apnea actually is a pretty common condition, which is most likely underdiagnosed and under-evaluated because many people don't realize that they have it. Every time I stop breathing, she's, you know, the next morning, yeah, sleep apnea, yeah, sleep apnea. I'm like, what is sleep apnea? Well, sleep apnea is a condition where 
a person is unable to get air into their lungs when they fall asleep. Every time the person stops breathing, they wake up, they stop breathing, they wake up. And that exposes the body to a myriad of really adverse stresses. And that does have consequences. Irritability, can't focus and maintain attention. They are unable to sleep in the same bedroom with their bed partner or spouse. There's about a sevenfold increased risk of motor vehicle accidents. It's linked with the obesity epidemic to being linked with cardiovascular or heart disease. High rates of stroke, diabetes, and even mortality. And so now, so now we got to fix it. Don't want to go out like that. So Shaq, one of the things that uh, we, we talked about. I'm meeting with the sleep doctor, my main man, Dr. C. You know, he said he wanted me to be part of his sleep study. We arranged for an overnight recording in which we could actually find out whether Mr. O'Neill has sleep apnea. So tonight, electrodes on the head, and you now they're gonna study the brain waves. Hopefully my, my REMs and my non-REMs. See, I read that, my rapid eye movements. Oh, and the end of the what? <laughs> non-rapid oh. eye movements, so, you know, hopefully I, I don't have it, but if I do have it, you know, I know I'm working with the best people to, you know, get a cure. You all ready to go to sleep? Yes, sir. Okay, good luck with everything. We'll be here monitoring. So the evaluation of sleep apnea is a test while they're asleep. And every second of the study will be looked at, and then the physician will interpret it and make a conclusion. To cut to the chase, you have moderate sleep apnea here. Obstructive sleep apnea is a chronic condition which is eminently treatable. All right, so you said there's the mask, the mouthpiece and surgery. Correct. The treatment of choice as of today for sleep apnea is to go ahead with, with nasal sleep apnea, the mask. And is this forever treatment or just a six week thing? We, we generally regard this as lifelong treatment. Getting a mask to fit effectively is, is often a cardinal part of effective treatment. I have a mask here that I can look at. If a person is able to use the CPAP device, it works almost 100% of the time. Oh yeah, this is yeah, this is pretty good. This is nice, I like it. Can I wear it to the club? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, this is nice. Okay, I like good. it. I'll do it. Okay. Since I've met with Dr. C, and you know, I've been getting at least seven, eight, nine hours of sleep a day. Feel good, the weight is good, got a lot of energy, the relationship is good at the house. Everything is working. <laughs> All right, so that's sleep apnea. And lastly, SIDS. So SIDS is always very sad. SIDS is a sleep apnea resulting from immature respiratory pacemaker systems or arousal mechanism. So basically, it's where the child suffocates because the child's respiratory system is not aware that it's not breathing, so the, the child suffocates. Um, so one thing that's important is putting babies to sleep on their back can help uh, prevent this from happening and this can um, prevent, uh, help pre prevent SIDS.